Today on Eco Explorers, join Aaron as he learns about birds on Galveston Island from Josh Fry. Learn why bird watching is a fun and rewarding hobby no matter where you are located. We are here on Galveston Island in Texas, just weeks after Hurricane Ike, one of the most destructive hurricanes ever to hit the United States. Here, we will be exploring the world of birding. Welcome to Eco Explorers, I'm Aaron Sproul. Today's show was planned to take place on Galveston Island prior to Hurricane Ike. We've decided to keep with that plan and see the effect the hurricane has had on the birds of Galveston despite all the destruction and debris that you are going to see. There are millions of birders in the United States making bird watching a unique and growing hobby. Hobby bird watching can take place anywhere in the city, in the suburbs, in the mountains, along the coast, out in the country, and even in your own backyard. I'm here with Josh, amateur birder. How did you begin birding? Uh, well, I took ornithology while I was in college. I met my wife and, and she took it to college too and we both kind of started birding it together. So how long have you been birding then? So we've been doing that for about three or four years. Three or four years? Interesting. And what is your educational background? Uh, I'm a, I have a marine biology degree from, from Texas A&M. How many different birds have you seen? Um, I'm about at 200. About 200? 200. 200 birds. So over the course of four years, yep. you've seen 200 birds? Yeah. And what are some of the good times of year to go birding? The best time is in the spring during the migration when you get all the birds coming up from Central and South America heading, heading north. What type of equipment is needed for someone to actually go out there and bird themselves? Well, uh, you need some type of optical equipment, so um, most people just use binoculars. Um, some other people use scopes. What, what are some other types of equipment that you'd use? You want a, a field guide that you could use to help identify the birds you've seen if you, if you don't know what they are. What type of education is needed to actually go birding? You don't need any education, just a desire to have fun and go see some cool birds. So when we go out birding today uh, here on Galveston Island, what should we expect to see? Coastal birds, a lot of wading birds, um, both large and small, um, various gulls, um, even get your, your common residential birds like doves, sparrows, stuff like that. Since you started birding, how did you find the areas to actually bird watch? You can go anywhere. You can go in your backyard, you can go to the beach, go to a park, um, any place that has habitat, um, trees, bushes, water, food. If someone's interested in bird watching, are there groups or organizations that they could contact to actually bird watch? Oh, yeah. Are you aware of some? There's uh, the National Audubon Society. They have different um, offices all over the country. Um, then there's a lot of local groups, um, like Galveston Island has the Galveston uh, Ornithological Society, and they do a lot of bird watching together. When you actually go bird watching, what are some of the characteristics that you look at to identify a bird? First off, your location. Then you look at at their body, their head, their bill, their size, where they have long legs, like for wading in water, what their shape is like when they're flying, what their coloration is. So you have a lot of different characteristics that you can actually look at to identify a bird. Oh yeah, a lot of them. Stay with us on Eco Explorers. When we come back, we will go with Josh into his own backyard and see what birds can be found there. Explorers is brought to you by Caribbean Dive Vacations. Everywhere to dive in the Caribbean. Call today, 888-462-8875. Ocean Reef, connecting divers. Visit OceanReefGroup.com for all of your dive communication needs. Mach 1 Audio, the publisher of Scuba and Scuba Vacation DVDs. Available at ecoexplorers.tv. Welcome back to Eco Explorers. 
I'm Aaron. Perhaps the easiest place to bird watch is in your own backyard. Let's look and see what can be found in Josh's backyard. Josh began teaching us birding techniques in his backyard by using one of his favorite field guides for identifying birds. Josh's backyard is probably less than a tenth of an acre, however it offers many amenities that small birds require. His yard contains several bird baths, bird houses, and most importantly bird feeders including one for hummingbirds. The first bird that Josh showed us was a house sparrow. This is one of the smallest birds that you will find in your yard. As you can see, the house sparrow is a small, stocky bird with a thick bill and short legs. The house sparrow back is brown with black streaking. Being a small bird, it can be a daunting task competing for time at the feeder. As we can see, many birds come and go after grabbing a tasty treat. There are many species of dove located in your own backyard. Here we see the white-winged dove. The white-winged dove is relatively easy to identify from the white on the edge of the wing. It is a medium-sized bird, but a large dove. Notice how the bird ruffles its feathers. Most people believe that to mean the bird is angry or stressed. Actually, it's just the opposite in that the bird is happy or content. Notice the size of the white-winged dove in relation to the house sparrow. The white-winged dove is much larger than the sparrow and only slightly smaller than the great-tailed grackle. Doves are perhaps the most common species of birds and can be seen in any backyard as they are found almost anywhere. Josh continued to help identify many of the birds that were in constant flux around the feeder. Another species of dove we see here is the ring turtle dove. It gets its name from the black ring located on the back of its neck. The ringed turtle dove is a domesticated bird and has been for so long that its wild origins are not known for certain. It frequently escapes from captivity and feral populations have become established in some cities in the southern United States. It is interesting because this bird feeds mostly on the ground eating seeds. Here's another species of dove that Josh pointed out. This one's called an Inca dove. The Inca dove is small with brown coloration on its back. This dove is much smaller than the other doves we have seen. This dove's name derives from an odd behavior it does known as pyramid roosting. Pairs or groups of Inca doves may huddle together in the sunshine, with some sitting on the backs of others. The pyramid may be three layers high and include up to 12 birds. Here we see the gray-tailed grackle. One of the distinguishing characteristics Josh pointed out to us is it has yellow eyes and a distinctive black body. Great-tailed grackle is a bigger, more common, very loud and obnoxious bird, often found fighting for its territory. This large noisy bird is easily identifiable by the yellow eyes and solid black body. The great-tailed grackle has been expanding its range in North America throughout the last century. It has taken advantage of urbanization and irrigation to move northward from Mexico into much of the western United States. Three different subspecies of the great-tailed grackles have expanded into the United States from three separate areas of Mexico. As it expands its range northward, 
the great-tailed grackle tends to migrate out of the most northern areas. However, it is quickly becoming a resident of the northern areas and staying through the winter. The males and females of the birds we have seen are relatively the same. The great-tailed grackle does not follow this pattern. Males are iridescent black, while females are a dull brown and significantly smaller. This bird is considered a pest species because it damages crops and forages in flocks with other blackbirds in urban areas. It's amazing the amount of birds you can find in your own backyard. When we come back, we'll head to the coast and see what shorebirds we can find there. Welcome back to Eco Explorers. I'm Aaron. We're here on the coast of Galveston Island. Let's see what shorebirds we can find here. As we walk along the coastline, remember it has only been a few short months since the devastation brought by Hurricane Ike. Through the use of the pesticide DDT, this bird's population was diminished significantly. Here it's making a comeback. This is the brown pelican. The ban on DDT led to the population recovery and it was removed from the endangered species list in Atlantic coast states in 1985. The brown pelican catches fish using their large bills with an extendable pouch. It is found along the ocean shores and not on inland lakes. It is the only dark pelican. This pelican sights prey from the air and plunges into the water head first, traps the fish in an extended pouch, drains the water out the sides of the bill, and then swallows the fish. This is the only bird of prey that we saw. It's the osprey. It actually catches fish using its talons rather than its beak. The osprey is one of the largest birds of prey in North America. It eats almost exclusively fish with live fish accounting for about 99 percent of its diet. The osprey dives feet first into the water to grab fish from near the surface and often hovers over the water before it dives. The osprey is one of the most widespread birds in the world, found on all continents except Antarctica. This is another bird whose population declined drastically in the 1950s through the 1970s from the pesticide DDT. After the ban on DDT, populations increased rapidly. However, it is still listed as endangered or threatened in some states. This bird here is called the willet. It gets its name from the vocalizations it makes, which sounds like willet. It's easily distinguishable by its wings when it's flying. They have a white and black stripe across the back of them. The willet is a large sandpiper of the interior west and the ocean beaches. It is known by its piercing calls and bright black and white flashing wings. It is the only North American sandpiper whose breeding range extends southward into the tropics. Off in the distance, Josh pointed this cool bird out to us. It's the little blue heron. It only gets to be about two feet tall. This is a smallish heron of the southeastern United States and breeds in various freshwater and estuarine habitats. The little blue heron is the only heron species in which first year birds and adults show dramatically different coloration. First year birds are pure white, while adults are blue. This advantage of white plumage is that young little blue herons are more readily able to integrate into mixed species flocks of white herons, thus gaining a measure of protection against predators. The little blue heron eats small fish, amphibians, and aquatic invertebrates by foraging slowly and methodically. 
the bird will walk slowly and peering before moving along to a new spot. Most people would call these birds seagulls, but Josh corrected me and explained that these are actually laughing gulls. Seagulls actually encompass all the birds in the gull family. This bird feeds along the ocean, on rivers, at landfills, and in urban parks. The preferred diet is fish, squid, flying insects, and often garbage and human junk food. It can even be seen stealing food from terns and pelicans. It's interesting to know that today this is one of the most abundant birds we've seen. However, nesting colonies in northeastern United States were nearly eliminated by egg and plume hunters in the late 19th century, which required the population to become protected. Populations have increased over the last century following the protection. Similar to the little blue heron, here we see the great blue heron. It gets to be about four feet tall. The great blue heron is gray and black and twice as tall as the little blue heron, reaching almost four feet tall. They have long legs, a long S-shaped neck, and a long thick bill. This is the largest and most widespread heron in North America and can be found along most ocean shores or the edge of a small inland pond. An all-white form is found from southern Florida into the Caribbean and used to be considered a separate species, the great white heron. It's tragic the amount of debris and trash that can be found along the coast here in Galveston Island. But the good thing is it's had little effect on the coastal birds that we found here today. When we come back, we'll head to the marsh to see what birds are out there. Welcome back to Tico Explorers. I'm Aaron. Local environments usually dictate the type of birds you're gonna see. Let's head to the marsh and see what birds we can find out there. Josh pointed this pretty bird out to us. It's called the snowy egret. A small, active white heron, the snowy egret is found in small ponds as well as along the ocean shore. Its black legs and yellow feet quickly identify it. As with other types of heron, it feeds by walking slowly and peering before moving along to a new spot. There's many types of egrets. We've seen the snowy egret. Here we see the great egret. A large white heron, the great egret is found across much of the world, from southern Canada southward to Argentina, and in Europe, Africa, Asia, and Australia. It's the largest egret in the old world, and thus has garnered the name great white egret. Look at the bright orange bill on this bird. Josh told us that it was the American oyster catcher. True to its name, it is specialized in feeding on bivalves, oysters, clams, and mussels, and uses its brightly colored bill to get at them. The American oyster catcher is easily identified by the bright white belly, dark back, dark head, and oversized bright red beak. Birds with really long legs in proportion to their body are known as stilt birds. This bird that we see here is actually known as the black neck stilt. The black-necked stilt can be identified from the really long pinkish legs, white belly, and dark back. They wade in the shallow water looking for food. Stilt birds have the second longest legs in proportion to their bodies of any bird, exceeded only by flamingos. Here we see the roseate spoonbill, one of the neatest birds that we've seen today, identifiable because it has a spoon-shaped bill and a vivid pink color. A bizarre wading bird of the southern coast, the roseate spoonbill is commonly mistaken for a flamingo. However, there are no flamingos in this area. It uses the bill by moving its head from side to side to catch shrimp and other food. Hurricane Ike has left a path of destruction along Galveston Island. The effects on the local population appear devastating, with trash and debris everywhere along the coast, in the marshes. Our thoughts go out to the people of Galveston Island and we wish them well on their endeavors of rebuilding. But as you can see, the destruction, the debris, has had little effect on the bird population. Bird watching offers rewarding benefits of getting outdoors and exploring local environments. 
For those of you that don't have access to the great outdoors, bird watching can even take place in your own backyard. As you've seen today, birds come in many varieties of colors, shape, sizes, and behaviors. So get out there and see what birds can be found in your area. You're going to love it. Visit ecoexplorers.tv for more information on bird watching. From all of us at Eco Explorers, we'll see you next time. Eco Explorers is brought to you by Caribbean Dive Vacations. Everywhere to dive in the Caribbean. Call today, 888-462-8875. Ocean Reef, connecting divers. Visit OceanReefGroup.com for all of your dive communication needs. Mach 1 Audio, the publisher of Scuba and Scuba Vacation DVDs. Available at EcoExplorers.tv.